boys, I got a really good episode for you guys. Those who are biker war lovers, I got some Arctic artifacts. Historical artifacts that you've never seen before probably. Very well hidden. Before I show you those historical photos, I want to give you the context and to introduce you to characters which you've already heard about if you've listened to the saga of the 1%. Today's episode is dedicated to the Rock Machine MC, a merry band of bikers that fought the Hells Angels who had their bastion in many cities. However, they started in Montreal's Saint-Henri, Southwest District. The story of an informant. The Calvary of a Rock Machine. The Rock Machine had integrated the realities of threats, especially an attempted threat, a deadly one, at the heart that became the heart of their preoccupations at the middle of the biker war, or in the middle of the biker war, going as far as wearing bulletproof vests and bringing weapons with them at the very little movements that they made throughout the city, including simply going around the corner to a, to a meat shop or slaughterhouse. We call them boucherie over here. It was the case of Peter Paradzi. Those who know the Sag of the 1%, I've shown pictures of Peter Paradzi, who told yesterday his ascension. This is an article in 2012, uh, 2002, my apologies. He talked about his ascension and then the fall of the rock machine in Verdun. Verdun is a neighborhood inside the Southwest. Remember the Southwest is the area, for those of you who came to Montreal, it's beyond the uh, Atwater Market. We'd consider that really the Southwest, which in does include Little Burgundy as well, and the Irish areas also. But specifically right now, he's talking about Verdun, and we will see why. So it was a neighborhood that was reputed as an independent territory for the sales of stupefiers for decades. Paradis did not doubt his calvary that was waiting for him on May of 1993. He heard about, he heard the talks about the first time the new gang did not recognize him. The rockers. The good days of independence were coming to an end. Resellers of these substances without any ties. He had received the non-solicited visit of Patrick Locke, who would have told them, Il n'y aura plus d'indépendant. T'as 24 heures pour répondre. That's my, uh, <laughs> my voice. Well, he said, there will be no more independence. You have 24 hours to answer. And this quote checks out a lot. It checks out. I've heard dozens of stories. It's clear and dry like this when someone visited them. Clear and dry. They, they would visit you with two gigantic goons with baseball bats. And they would come tell you, hand over your cell phone or else. And then anyone who contacted you through that dial -a dope operation, they would be answering the phone from now on. And they will tell him, we are the new owners. Yep, we'll, we'll come. We're sending someone right now. The men did not allow this to scare them. The rock machine. I sent him on his way. That's a expression in, in, in Quebecois. I sent him on a walk. And you can imagine what that means. It means exactly that. And a year later, he rallied to the rock machine at the invitation of Pierre Beauchamp and Renaud Jonf. I showed you pictures of his casket, Renaud Jonf. It's the picture in black and white. You see a male lying in his casket, and you see a big sign of the alliance. You remember that with the rock machine and all that? You know when they adorn someone when he's in his funeral? They adorn him with a bunch of stuff, whatever. Now, I'll show you pictures of that. In 1994, the independence had stopped slowly, except for certain families, says he, to explain his choice. There were attempts of bombs that had succeeded against them. So well they succeeded that Peter Paradis did not dare leave his home anymore without his bulletproof vest and a three fifty seven Magnum and an electronic cache that he needed to unlock himself with various levers. Imagine the ingenuity. This is 1993. No one even had internet at home. Barely anyone had a PC. This was not the era of everyone having a PC at home, not even yet. For a, for a busy day of the month of August 1998, Paradis was way too hot to wear his vest. Those who know when they come to Quebec, usually in the August months, it gets insanely hot. So he was too hot to wear his vest at his return home from the butcher. Butcher, that's the word. I was thinking about that. Anyways, he was almost arrived home with his bodyguard, Daniel Leclerc. 
which was who was always by his side. But Peter Paradis had noticed a vehicle that was following at an abnormal speed, quite slow. Barely had he turned around at the red corner that the car had had arrived near him, I guess, and he got fired four projectiles to the chest, the abdomen, and the back. Sorry, this I have no means. The Magnum 357 that was between the fingers of Monsieur Leclerc. Parody had found himself in the hospital, but the personnel who were worried about the apparatus, the security apparatus around his room, l allowed him to leave within eight days. My bandages were still bleeding. Parody was considered, at the moment of the attempt, as a director of the rock machine in Verdun. He had inherited the title the following day after the assassination of its president at the time, Renaud Jean, in October of 1996, without, and look at this, without its mentioning that no made man or full patch member had wanted to take control of this very hot territory. Now, for those who don't know, the Hells Angels, they have a, I call it a COQ system, for those of you who know. They did not send their full patch to go do any of this. They were sending people who, 20 years later, still are not able to join the Hells Angels, who were, the, who were responsible, such as Gregory Woolley, to go penetrate that territory, that hostile territory, which was not theirs, and to cause a mess to murder these people. So Gregory Woolley and another guy, Strumpf. Do you remember him, Strumpf? Strumpf as well was sent on a, miss a mission in that area. Need I remind you, Strumpf was not a nomad then. But this obviously cemented his ascent into becoming the nomad not long after, right? So the rockers were not in interesting enough. I think he mentioned the rocker that visited them, right? Earlier in the article. There you have it. They were the disposable ones. That's why they were created. Let's get going. The war had begun by... Acts of intimidation inside of bars, where the rockers and the rock machine exhibited, each at their turn, their colors to mark their territories. And after the, and after the fact, it degenerated into a full-out armed conflict for protection and even expansion of these territories. At the end of his criminal journey in 1999, Peter Paradzi had nothing left to defend. No more territory. It was my life that I was defending. Now imagine you do all this, you lose best friends, all that blood that shed. And then 10 years later, your leadership, they jump to the other side. What about all the other people who died? So in, in actuality, they died for nothing. May I suggest a true man of honor would have let go in honor of their friends. They said, you know what? I'm not joining anything. I'm as good as done now, because look, they're joining the Hells Angels. They were done. But I'm not going to forget my past friends. Their deaths will not be in vain. That's what I would have personally, not that I'm uh, <laughs> involved in anything. But if you're a real friend to your buddies, if they truly didn't die for nothing, I would honor their memory that way. I'd find it out. Me personally, this is horrible. I'm not sure. I think there's a chance he joined the Hells Angels. I'm telling you, Salvatore Cazetta joined the Hells Angels. The other guy also joined the Hells Angels. We talk about him a lot. You remember him. I forgot his name. Fame's not coming up right now. They're not the only ones. There's a, a bunch of them. Let's keep going. Put in the accusation spot, I guess in trial, for the traffic of stupefiers and for gangsterism. He reclaimed a prison. He, recl he reclaimed the prison to wait for his process because he could not assure his own security in the streets of Verdun, his childhood neighborhood. Paradzi had finally decided to be a witness against members of his own network. So you can forget about him joining the Hells Angels. In his first process for gangsterism in history against uh, Canadian justice, he himself pled guilty to accusations in January of 2000, and he got a 12-year sentence in the penitentiary. And he refound his liberty last 4th of April. Let's go up. This article is 2002. I find that strange. So he got a sentence of 12 years. He left two years later. Canada. His contract as witness, that's why he got it out early, he says, repented criminal, right? He says his contract had a clause stipulating that he would purge his sentence in one prison in the, jur in the provincial jurisdiction instead of the federal pen, which allowed him to have 
outings in the sixth of this sentence. I'm not sure what the hell that means. Sixth year, he seems to have only done two, no? This article is 2002. And they say that he was sentenced in 2000. So I'm all over the place. I'm confused. I'm missing something. It's on me. But look at here. Here's a quote from him. It's been 12 years. It passed fast, said the lawyer. Let me just double check. I was sure I saw 2002, I meant. You see? 2002. Doesn't check out for me too much. The story's a little bit all over the place for, for my tastes. Please, someone knows where I'm going wrong. Tell me. We're, we're. In memory of the fallen soldiers of the rock machine, let's look at some pictures. Never before seen except during that era. No one on YouTube. You have to be from around here to be able to know where to look. So here we have one board here. It says, Rock Machine, Respect. We see three skulls. That's what it is, guys. You sent your friends to the death and then turned your back up. Second picture. So I note your attention. These are pictures from the press from October of 1996. If you paid attention in the article, what happened in October 1996? Peter Paradis it was, I believe. He became a leader, right? How did he become the leader? Someone had replaced someone. Am I right? It was not Renaud Jonf. So Renaud Jonf had got offed. Let's look at those pictures, my friend. A glimpse into our history. Urgel Bougie. Bougie. This is a funeral home, right? And here we have pictures. Classic old pictures. Look at the hairstyle, the hairdo. Remember, 1996, guys. What ne neighborhood is this going to be? Of course, it's got to be Verdun, the Southwest, right? And here we have their motorcycles, one near the, uh, the other. Seems to be Harley Davidson. Photo number two, exhibit number two. So they seem to be leaving a few. Is this the funeral home they're leaving? Or they're bringing their, his casket to a... They're walking away from this door, so they're probably not coming. Or they are leaving this place. I'm not too sure. Probably will be able to discern in a... Here we have the people. I do not recognize them. Masked here. You, uh, it's obviously not for the same reasons as today. Interesting, isn't it? The funeral of their friends. Some of them are masked. Are they doing this as a s sort of pageantry? Or are they blocking their faces from their enemies to target? Interesting, no? But they still have to carry the show. Show of force. However, by doing so, you're also making yourself well known who you are. How many of them are either gone or joined the Hells Angels. I'll leave that up to you. If anyone recognizes anyone, let us know. Picture number two. From the back, we have the vest, I believe, right? Still blocked face, same guy. And we have, there's always a fatty. Always. Even the Hells Angels. The number, was it number two or number three of the Hells Angels? Was a big fatty like this. Uh, at the time, the one at the time. Or was it number three? I forgot his name. It's not coming to my head. But you know, there's always that uh, that guy. Portos. I call him Portos. You know, if anyone watched The Three Musketeers, D'Artagnan, someone else, and Portos. This is my Portos. Let's go. Next. Carrying who is Jean. Renaud Jean. May he rest in peace, man. Here we have it. Avenue Egan. So, these are, you see how ugly the streets are, guys. This is the Southwest. It's not a pretty neighborhood. There is no suburbs there. It's dilapidated bars, dilapidated duplexes, and garbage, and cigarette remainders everywhere for anyone who ever came to quebec you will never see as much smokers as quebec or if you go to france especially during that era remember this is before they started to exaggerate with all the you can't do this you can't do that there's just so many rules now it's getting absolutely ridiculous it's almost even disrespectful and condescending that's completely unnecessary but back to the subject giving you an idea of the verdun it's a it's like a shady area everything's gray Sorry about that. I'm not going to lie to you. Sure, there's a, there's areas that it's going to be a little bit more green. Yeah, sure. But you know what I mean? The heart of Verdun or Point St. Charles. I'm not mincing words here. I grew up the, in the place. It's I would not recommend raising your children there. Although it's a historic place and it's very close to downtown. You can see it from here. Do you see that right there? Those are the downtown buildings. Now, they look closer than they are. You're, it's almost the reality is from this view how you have to view it a little bit it's like being in Brooklyn and I don't know if you could see from the Brooklyn Bridge you could see Manhattan it's a little bit like that it's still a journey to get there you feel what I'm saying it's not as close as it looks from here guys you're not gonna walk straight if, uh, from this street and, and reach that you're gonna need a car okay or you're gonna take the underground subway it's a while off okay I just want to get you the perspective but at the same time I gives you an idea of the uh, of the surroundings. What kind of, it's very, very urban. Now, here's the rock machine on their motorcycle. You see, they don't have the beautiful looking vests like the Hells Angels, not because of a lack of money. It seems like the rock machine, 
from what we understand today, they were not initially interested in having everything, like looking like the classic bikers all around. They were just a group of guys making money because some of them were bikers, like Salvatore Cazetta. He had the, the hookups, the connections, Indian reserves for contraband cigarettes. Not only that, we know that he, ha he had a connection in the mob. So he was able to get himself a good price on that cane. And at a certain point, as he grew bigger and the bikers became more daring, they dissociated from the mob a little bit. And you, we know from evidence that Salvatore Cazetta and his brothers made alliances with bikers in the United States. I'm not saying the alliance as in like they joined the rock machine or anything like that. But they had to get their blow from the United States. And we, they had busts of like 750 kilos, something like that. The same size amounts as Reynald Desjardins being busted, or Vito Rizzuto. That gives you an idea. And he financed it how? We know that some of his financiers had to be people from his neighborhood, the Southwest. Who, what other criminal organization do you know from that area that I always talk to you about? Talk to you about? Jerry Matix, the Irish West End Gang. This is not a question. Not a question at all. They got funding from them, or they were in business with them, at the very least, and the business was about Kane. Now we understand each other a little bit more. Now do you understand why we had an Irish Westy uh, defaussé I talked to you about? Why do you think he was in the alliance trying to put bounties on the Hells Angels' head? Do you see where I'm going? Do you see how it's starting to make sense now? Let's get going. Next, Oh yeah, one thing before I forget in this picture that you need to know. Palmer's MC. That would be the equivalent of a puppet gang. It is a puppet gang. Underling of... The rock machines. So if I had to see a one-for-one -one comparison, these would be the rockers equivalent for the rock machine. The Palmer's MC. My, my, might I add, the name's pretty cool. Next, next one. So who do you think they would contract or who would be doing their dirty work? It's not supposed... The same thing as... The same principle as the Hells Angels. These guys here are the leadership. They would have probably sent the Palmer's to do their dirty work. But the rock machine were warriors. We know that put, they put in work themselves also. Without question. Go to the next one, boys. Yeah, so my question earlier, I said, they seem to be walking out of that building. This looks exactly like that building. So this is a picture probably a few seconds before picture number one or number two. Remember? So they're carrying his ca casket out once again. Rest in peace to Renaud Jonf. Rest in peace to all, all the southwestern mobsters or bikers who died in that war and who, who got swiped under the rug. Their blood paid for what? It's wrong. Get to the next question, uh, the next pick. One can only imagine if that's his wife or that's his daughter. I'm very sorry, very, very sorry on her show. I didn't filter the picture, obviously. I'm so sorry. Look at her. Sorry, okay. Look at, here we have Rock Machine, Quebec, it says. Woodland Avenue, right? We're still in Montreal, still in the Verdun area, I assume. I forget my streets, guys. Rock Machine, Quebec. And you see the A, 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 A. What do you think the A is for inside of the, and we have the Cadillacs. Make a big show in their neighborhood. It's theirs. When they say independent, they just mean independent from the Hells Angels. <laughs> and we're talking about the Irish West End Gang. So we have A for the alliance. There's an alliance. So can we assume that there's going to be Westies in these pictures? Probably, man. Probably. Let's keep going. What can I say to say? Is that his daughter or, or is this just passerby? Now, from the back, not more details to add. Palmer's MC. We have the Bolt Insignia. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not going to add any words to that. And we have the A's. Probably explaining why their members are all one <laughs> distinct race. Don't ask yourself. But I know people are saying, no, 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 it's just biker lore, man. Well, you know, you could have a lot of other decisions, another choice of signals, symbols to use, you know, than wear this one proudly, in my opinion. Next picture. All right, can we get people? There you go. We have the police scanning them before they enter the funeral parlor. Because maybe... Their enemies will dress as rock machines, perhaps, and try to get inside the funeral and plant a bomb. That would not be far-fetched one bit at this point. Nothing would shock us. They were mean, nasty, and vicious with each other. Unreasonably so. So there we have them. Palmer's respect. That's This one's going to be a Palmer's MC member. Or maybe it's a rock machine and he's just supporting his allies. Next picture. And we have the COQ women. You know, where are you now, honey? Where are you? They don't even really respect women either. Good job. How many times was she uh, passed around? I don't know. Let's keep going. Just to be around it. You know, they'll do anything. They're starstruck, these human beings. They won't date a regular blow. 
joke, a, a regular person. He's a joke to them. Well, let's see how her future is today, how she's living. I'm not gonna... I bet she's either moved on or it's, it's a sad life. Let's keep going, man. So here we have them. Note the style. It's always the same. These black, tiny glasses on the eyes. Remember these bags <laughs> when they were the in thing? Another thing that I'll draw your attention, I was hoping to see a guy with it. I have not seen it yet, but they're close enough. Some, the first picture had it close enough. Let's just take this guy. You see this haircut? Old school. Even Mam Boucher had this. It's not really a haircut. It's like the long hair in the back. We had a style before. They called it Coupe Longueuil. It was ugly as... <laughs> it was an 80s thing. They call it Coupe Longueuil. I was really hoping to show you that. But here we have it. And notice that they all seem to... They, none of them wear red bandanas. I don't know. Maybe it's just me noticing nothing. But they've always been wearing blue or dark colored gray bandanas. Just putting it out there. What else do they have in similarities? Of course, they have the type of clothes with the logos. Sure. But the glasses. In the end, they all, they all look the same. Even the Hells Angels look kind of like this. Now... The Hells Angels have more of a uniform clothes, way more rigid, standardized, or trademarked, branded, way more like, the, you know what I'm saying? It's more standardized, whereas the Rock Machine seems like, eh, fine, we got one shirt with something on it, and the rest wear that the hell you want, but they all want to look like bikers, so they end up looking the same anyways. Next picture. Here we have kids, cute kids, <laughs> pointing, it's got to be a cool, you know, <laughs> and that kid's not even alive, <laughs> he's passed out. The good times, you know, we can all appreciate being that age. So look at the people in the back, all staring crazy. Huh? And you have police securing the parameters so that no savages come and try to do a drive-by and eliminate everyone in one sitting. Because you know that could happen. Now, it was October, a few days before Halloween. I don't know why this picture. And none of these names are. We know Frankenstein, right? But it's not has nothing to do. Next picture, gorgeous, man. I love people who take Halloween serious. Uh, if I could just add something. Halloween, when I was growing up, I remember way back, I used to come home with two, like minimum three full bags, maybe even four bags. I had so much candy, and then we'd pour it in the living room, and then we'd try to remove what we thought could be poisoned or half open or things we really didn't like. The, the, <laughs> the clown parents that would put fruits. <laughs> oh, man, I hated those. It had to be candy. But you know what I noticed? These years... Almost no homes celebrate them anymore, man. There's very few homes with decorations or handing out candies compared to before. I used to come in with four bags. Guys, I'm seeing kids coming with half a bag. Not even, you know. It's pitiful, man. It's not like it used to be when we were kids. Maybe it's because, I don't know, does technology have anything to do with this? Kids not even playing outside. When I was growing up, I'm sure some of you remember you yourself. We'd spend the whole day outside, man. The neighbors know each other. Everyone knew each other. We'd play with the neighbor's kids. It was great. You'd just hear your mom yelling at you, come home to eat. And then you'd come home and your mom would maybe tell you, hey, uh, you went out for like three hours. You should have came back. How do I know someone didn't pick you up? That's how it was growing up. Beautiful generations era. But I'm sure every generation says that about the previous one. And so I feel sorry for the future generation of kids. Now, it wouldn't be fair, we talked about Renaud Jonf without looking at him. So, here he is, Renaud Jonf. Who is he? In his honor. Born 1959. A 50s baby. So, he's from another generation, my friend. Let's not forget these people. The King of Verdun. Known for being the founding member of the Rock Machine. President of the Montreal Chapter. Who were the predecessors before him. Remember, Salvatore Cazella and his brother were arrested. So, the majority of the biker war, they were inside of a prison. So, Salvatore Cazetta, his brother Giovanni Cazetta, I just mentioned them earlier. Successor, successor, sorry, Peter Paradis. Checks out, does it not? It seems he had allegiance to the SS Motorcycle Club at a certain point. But remember, this is way before now, before the Biker War. This is the Motorcycle Club that was, I believe, patched into the Hells Angels. Or they were, rec some members were recruited, at the very least, including Mam Boucher and his right-hand man, I forgot his name, Biff Hamel, which is a classic biker name, Biff. There you have it. That means, was he part of it, or did he have an allegiance to them? Remember, at a certain point, it's probably the case they were friends. Remember, the, remember I told you a long time ago, the Rock Machine didn't always, or the people who constitute the Rock Machine were not always enemies with the Hells Angels. There was a 360-degree flip that happened when Mam Boucher became its president. His greed, his reluctance to negotiate, and wanting the whole pie for himself. Where did that land him? Where did that land many Hells Angels? Could they not have worked it out? Now look, they're all part of the same family. And Renaud Jean's sacrifice 
For what? For nothing. Let's read. He played a major role in the biker war. We know this. After the imprisonment of Salvatore and Giovanni, oh, there you go, checks out, right here. A possession he held until his 1996 death. We saw the funeral. Renault Jean. He had a thriving stupefier network and had earned the title of king. We're going to go down here on this way. The death and funeral, because that's what we saw. On the 18th of October, 1996, Jean was shot and killed. The rock machine leader was seated with fellow club members, Christian Deschênes, Raymond Loro in a booth at the rear of a Chinese restaurant known as Restaurant Kim Hoa. I wouldn't be shocked if it's still there. There's tons of cheap Chinese restaurants over there. Definitely. It's known for that. They have bars and, and these cheap restaurants. It's a dilapidated neighborhood. Unless it changed. That's how it was when I was there. A man entered the establishment and they were seated at the very end. He approached the table, fired several shots, and fled out the rear of the building. They knew he would hang out there, it seems. Or did they follow him? Jean and Deschênes were killed, while Loro was wounded in the shoulder. One of the Paradis brothers, Peter Paradis, would succeed Jean as president of the Montreal chapter, taking over much of the business in the suburb of Verdun. Suburb. He would eventually turn crown informant. We just saw that. We saw the absolute article 2002 telling the story, right? The actual evidence. Archive. In the club, 15 years of existence at the time, he was the first member to turn crown witness. After the conflicts and subsequent crackdown by police, during the trial, he revealed that he was also present at the restaurant during the murder of Jean and Deschênes. Proclaimed that Jean's cousin, Michel Germain, was responsible for the ambush? Wow. According to Paradis, Germain sold them out to the Hells Angels after a disagreement with the two. This loss deeply affected members of the Hells Angels due to Jean's highly regarded status within the organization. This is a heartbreak. Need I remind you, years later, we have the other guy. That biker who was a devil's disciple I always talk to you about on the, one of the last episodes of the Sag of the 1%, which they demonetized, by the way. Well, I showed you the picture of the guy. He's on the front page of the thumbnail. I forgot his name. He joined, he sold them all out. Ten times worse than this. And now he's a highly regarded Hells Angels. Could that be possible in the American Hells Angels? That an outlaw who paid to kill many members, who was at the cent center of all this, could then say, I don't want to be an outlaw anymore. Please don't kill me. I'll join you. Let you decide. On the 24th of October, 1996, Jean's funeral ceremony was held. On October 23rd, the day previous, authorities arrested members of the Rowdy Crew Motorcycle Club, a Hells Angels support club who had been loitering near the funeral home. Did you see that? Forcing the family to cancel the church services. That is absolutely disgusting. Instead, Jean's body, followed by five limousines, we saw that, eh, and 11 Cadillacs, carried a silver and black floral arrangements, was taken to the East End Crematorium. Now, Rowdy Crew. We know it's an underling clan of the group of the Hells Angels. We had our buddy here, Maxim, who sent me something yesterday, or was it today, about that. So why don't we investigate what he sent us as a thank you. Merci beaucoup, Maxim. Oh, yeah, and I just wrote an email to Maxim. Maxim will know exactly what I'm talking about. I just wrote him an email. I saw he sent me another link. Well, boy, we are lucky, man. We're gonna... This is thanks to Maxim, this article, by the way. And we have another one he just added to this. This episode, it would not be possible without him. Let's read. Who are the Rowdy Crew, La Nodière? This is a website that existed for a very long time. I remember seeing it. I could be wrong, but I do remember the, uh, it's a website that links many other stories also. It's probably one of the only ones. Whoever did this, God bless your heart. I don't know if he's still alive. He's probably an old man when he wrote this. He's, maybe he's not even here anymore. Let, let's, I don't know who he is, but in his honor, whoever you are, good sir, thank you. Rowdy Crew Lanaudière Chapter. The Lanaudière Chapter based no, sorry, the Lanaudière based Rowdy Crew Motorcycle Club has maintained a very low profile. The gang was founded on July 10th, 1993, so a few months before Jean's murder. Crazy, huh? And they were sent to intimidate his wife and kids. That's wrong, man. And as since, as a puppet club of the Hells Angels, Trois Rivières chapter, taken over Lanaudière highly profitable distribution. I need to remind you this website is probably about 20 years old, okay? Remember that. These are not, whenever he talks in the present, we don't know that, okay? If it's still the same, same crew, etc. For all we know, the police may have dismantled these guys, you know what I mean? So don't take it for word like that, but it's absolutely, he's reliable. Just see it as a, 
glance in history, okay? We're going back 20 years in the mind of a, of a, of a beautiful man who did this service for us. May he, wherever he is, I hope he's resting in peace, if he's, alive, if he's not alive. Shortly after their creation, the group showed that they meant business. Two Joliet police officers approached a serious car parked near a bar. But as the cops approached, a dozen thugs ex exited the establishment and became aggressive towards the officers. The cops quickly retreated to their car, but soon returned with reinforcements. Stéphane Benny, Marcelin Morin, Alain Dugras, Luc Gauthier, Daniel Saillant were arrested in connection with the incident. Rowdy crew member Mario Lucier and Hells Angels associate Serge Quesnel were behind the January 21st, 1995 murder of the Pelletier gang member Claude Le Pic Richard. Remember Pelletier ga gang? Remember that episode where there was like an explosion in the car and he had, we got the leader of the Pelletier clan out and he was melting? You remember that episode, guys? They demonetized that too. Thank you, YouTube. 100, maybe 100, 220 hours at build on episode. Poof, into the air, wasted my... Le Lucier drove the getaway car and Ken Kesnel pumped several bullets into Picard. On May 23rd, 1995, the Bubbles nightclub in Chemin Gascon in Terrebonne was blown up. The bar, which opened only on weekends, was empty when the blast occurred at 10 p.m. The club was frequented by members and associates of the rowdy crew, and police believed that the rock machine were behind it. The club's... The gang's clubhouse, which surrounded, which was surrounded by a three-meter-high cedar fence and equipped with steel doors, floodlights, and security cameras, was bombed on August 23, 1995, by rivals of the Rock Machine. The bomb blasted a hole the size of a garage in the concrete wall and demolished the basement. The only fatality was the gang's Rottweiler, guard dog, poor dog. On October 20th, 1995. Montreal's Carcajou squad arrested six rowdy crew members in Le Gardeur and La Valtrie, east of Montreal. This is not Laval. It's La Valtrie, just to be clear. Four were charged with drug possession, one for improper storage of a firearm, and another was wanted by the police. Two days later, four members of the club and a Hells Angels were arrested and charged with conspiracy to murder, assault, and possession of prohibited weapons and possession of drugs. The information police claimed came from a drug dealer who said he was beaten and threatened by gang members. The Carcajou squad struck, struck again on November 4th of 1995, so two years after Jean's death, to give you a timeline. The anti-gang unit raided a bar just south of Rodin that was controlled by the Rowdy crew. 33 sticks of dynamite and 10 detonators were confiscated. Uh, confiscated. Sorry about that. They shoot Rodden. We have a little like waterfall place in the Rodden, you know. I met two cool brothers there working in construction. Were very nice dudes. Once they came to Little Bernie to fix something inside my house, I could only repay him with some green. We had a good joint together. They were cool, very nice, humble dudes. They gave me a very good impression. And they would tell me, you need to come to shoot Rodden. Ra uh, where are we now? Rowdy crew member Guy Ticu. Majo. TQ means little butt. It's an expression we usually usually use for sp short guys. It's not TQ like or for we maybe maybe sometimes for like a kid sometimes, but usually we people don't use words like that to describe innocent children, you know. But it's not an insult. It's just an expression. It's like le TQ, the little guy, the little guy. That would be the best equivalent. But look at this, rowdy crew member. Guy Ticu Majo disappeared in the spring of 1997. Majo had an extensive police record, and it is believed that he was murdered on the behalf of the Hells Angels. Who? Louis Melou Roy. The guy who passed in the... Apparently, he passed in the grinder of meat. Once they were, he was no longer... He no longer wanted to be part of the Hells Angels business. He wanted to keep his business for himself. That was unacceptable to, the, to them. We know this because we also had the information come out in Scopa Files. And uh, was it Andrea Scopa said this himself. Disgusting, huh? And Sylvain Baptiste Tifo of the Trois Rivières chapter. Turn your attention just a quick second. The Quebec names, you'll notice a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of cities, a lot of towns, a lot of family names are Catholic priestly names like John the Baptist. It, it's a fact that the French colonists, when they arrived here, they arrived here under the tutelage or banner of religion, of Catholicism, and we know that went a wire. Big time. And they have intergenerational trauma from that. So they have words and expressions like tabarnak. Tab it's a tabernak inside of the church, right? The holy area. So they're swearing on the name of that holy area. You can imagine. That's all. That's how bad they feel religion did them. 
You see, intergenerational trauma has lasting impacts. The way we treat each other is going to have lasting impacts for the next generations. Don't ever undermine that. Understate that, my friend. The Rowdy Crew's former president, Serge Labarasseur, was arrested on extortion charges on May 6, 1998. According to police, he and three associates had tried to extort money from a former associate. When he refused, the group assaulted him and took a motorcycle and watercraft. I guess it's a boat? Uh, members Stéphane Lalonde, Steve Poirier, were arrested along with associates Sébastien Girard and Hughes Bouchard on March 20th of 2000. After having threatened an independent drug dealer, police were aler alerted and intercepted their vehicles. Three loaded firearms were found in the vehicle. Before I forget, guys, here's a little lore. You guys, I used to have a teacher in high school because I went to saint Henri. He was an old man by then. He was in his 70s. He looked like Kentucky K KFC Colonel Sanders. Anyone, probably half of these rock machine guys know him. They probably went to that school. Some of them, at least some of them went to that school. They know who I'm talking about. He taught some of them. He would tell, I was too young to care. I was way too young to give a shit. He was talking constantly of having rock machines he would say oh yeah this kid i remember him that kid he was sitting in the back he would tell us stories like i didn't care but i remember that now some of you who are old enough now will remember his name was of that teacher he's long gone probably his name was serge prevot he was one of a kind teacher he would traumatize you. he was a phys a phys from physics i think phd in physics whatever and he would transport art from africa he knew these guys he knew them he taught them. He's see, he seen them grow up and become degenerates. Let's go down. Yeah. And possibly even a Hell's Angels. It was one or the, or the other. Chances are it's going to be Rock Machine, bro. Because he taught at that same school for a long time. And all the kids... There was only one school for the whole area. Everyone would go there. Except the Anglo, the few Anglophones. Because there's a rule in Quebec. I don't remember if it was, at that, it was applied at that time. You have to be like second or third generation Anglophone in order to be allowed to go to their English, English school. Other than that, you're going to go to the French schools. We all, from many various neighborhoods, mind you, Little Burgundy, Point St. Charles, Verdun, whatever, all those areas, my friend, they all, they're, they're, the high school students would congregate to that high school. So just a good chance Jean or some of them went to that school as well for a sec. I just wanted to throw it out there, some of you, for nostalgia's sake. Someone will remember it. It's cool. Terrebonne, bar owner Francis Laforêt was viciously beaten to death by three bat-swinging assailants on October 17th, 2000. Remember, this is by the end of the biker war. This is way past the middle part, right? We're at the very tail end. Laforêt had refused to allow the gang's drug pushers into his establishment, and as a result, the rowdy crew had him murdered. Shocked by the incident, over 2,000 people, including crime reporter Michel Auger, remember that guy? He passed away, I think, recently enough, a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken. See, guys, there's just so many facts. Michel Auger was the reporter who Mambouché had sent his underlings to go and try to off him in the parking. I don't know if it seemed like uh, they tried to off him for real. It didn't work. He survived that. So, shocked by the incident, over 2,000 people, including crime reporter Michel Auger, marched in Vieux Terbonne to honor the man's sacrifice and to protect against criminal intimidation. Maxime Roy, a suspect in La Forêt's murder, disappeared a week after the tavern's owner's death. Interesting, no? So the guy who went to do the job for the Hells Angels as a COQ. Look at how they treat them. For you guys who want to join. Maxime Roy, a suspect in La Forêt's murder, disappeared a week after the tavern's owner's death. Another of the Rowdy Crew's associates, Maxime Beauvais, vanished a short time later. Police arrested two members of the club and five associates. Where did they vanish, guys? I don't think they're that smart that they can vanish forever. Maybe you do the math. Maybe maybe one of them we found it. I don't know. You guys tell me. But I have a feeling that they truly did, quote, vanish. Was it worth it? On both sides. Look at that. Police arrested two members and five associates on April 10th, 2001. So like about a year later or six months, seven months later in connection with Laforêt's murder. But the case fell apart. Of course, the case fell apart. We're in Canada. Nothing's new under the sun. Five were released due to lack of evidence, and the other two were charged with drug possession. The rowdy crew, despite the increased police pressure after the vicious La Forêt incident, continued to flourish. Their impressive cast-like clubhouse in La Valtry is valued at that time. So this, this is what, beginning 2000, right? So 23 years ago, valued at $210,000. Remember I showed you a property in, uh, in Montreal that between 2000 to 2023, it went from 160 k to about 650 k So... 
You do the math. I don't know what the multiplier is. Is it like three times, four times? Do four times this. So this is about, we could, we could probably even give it, say, round it, a million dollar, million dollar castle-like clubhouse. La Valtry. So who are the rowdy? Well, well, well. Seems like we might be able to get an answer on that. And what happened to them? Maybe we'll be able to get an answer from this article. N need I say that Maxim is a genius? He knows what he's doing. He's leading me on the path. A journey to answers, because he's the one who recommended this second article, and he recommended it after the first one. So the following day, he sent me this one. You can't ask for a better guide. January 25, 2018, okay, about, what, five years ago? The presumed leader of the Hells Angels in trouble. The police officers suspect Mario Brouillette of dipping in stupefier sale. Here he is, Mario Brouillette, Hells Angels, clearly... Let me just, you can see it. The youngest Quebecer to ever join the Hells Angels in Quebec is now considered the true leader of a band of bikers. And he's, they're looking for, I think that's what they're saying. They're looking for, or he's under su suspicion. Let's just see what's going on. Mario Brouillette is suspected of being the head of a stupefier network. And we have the police squad that's after him. Enrico, remember that? Let's get going. He says that he had a network in Rive Nord. Rive Nord is going to be North Shore. Okay. Now, not North Shore in Montreal Island. When they say North Shore, they mean beyond the island. You know, like we're going now to Laval territory upwards. Rive Nord. You get it? And they say that he's di they're directly linked to influential members of the Hells Angels, this network that's selling stupefiers over. Keep going. Here's a picture. The police performing a search warrant inside of a jewelry shop on Rue Notre-Dame. Not the one in Montreal, but the one in the city of Repentigny who they suspect of having served as a cache for storing their stupefiers, which is linked to those angels. A retired boss, they called it. Even if he had sworn taken his retreat from the Hells Angels after his last condemnation in Operation Shark QC, Brouillette is nevertheless seen as someone who has the title at the top of the organization. Quote, C'est lui le boss. Il est très pesant. Même si on ne le voit pas dans les rassemblements. C'est un gars d'affaires très intelligent. Nous a told us recently a police source in, on the subject of the 45-year-old biker. This was 2018, so add five years. He's about 50 to 51. And just to, re, to rephrase this in English for you, he's the boss. He's, he weighs a lot. Even if we do not see him in the meetings, this is a guy, a businessman who is very intelligent, said a source for the police in regards to that 45-year-old at the time. He's about 50-year-old biker who had found his liberty, who was freed in the spring of 2016. M Mario Brouillette is not object of an, any other criminal accusations. And, his, and, and none of his properties are subject to, to a warrant or anything like that. New generation. That's the time. Himself, a son of a hell's angels. Where do you have it? There you go. And he was seen as the dolphin of Maurice Mamboucher, a.k.a. COQ. When the hell's angels were being relieved of springtime 2001. And he's incarnating the new generation of bikers. Contrary to bikers of the years 70s and the 80s, like Denis Puffy Ablul, remember that guy? Sag of the 1%, same one, the episode with, that I talked to you about, the betrayal, uh, Denis Pafiable, who went to buy that real estate property, and there was the motorcycles, remember that? That's him. So they're comparing him to Denis Pafiable, who who's way older than him, who was in the 70s and 80s, probably a biker. But he says, comp in, in comparison to him, he had never had a similar, he never had been made a real name in the criminal underworld back then, I guess. He climbed the echelons way later, but faster than mo almost anybody else, becoming a full patch Hells Angels at 23 years old. Again, remember, most of these Hells Angels that I'm talking to you about today, right? Very seldom are, are they any younger than like 40, 45. Usually they're in 50s, 40s. That's the youngest. So he made it at 23 years old. Think about that. And I'm not saying he made it at 23 back then in the 70s and 80s, which would have been way more usual or common. We are talking about this generation, this late generation, right? Parallelly, so note, I just want to get you one little note here. Let's register this for the future. So they don't recruit 20-year-old Hells Angels anymore. What made the difference for him? His father, the Hells. Could that have played one of the determinant factors 
Of course, it can't be the only one. But you understand, we understand each other. Let's see if that happens again. Let's see if that happens again. If it happens again, we hit a jackpot. It will be an interesting observation. Let's go down. Parallelly to other activities or criminal activities, he's associated to enter legitimate enterprises. So he has legitimate businesses. This is the new era of bikers. The businessman, Marc Solnier, with whom Brouillette detains a gym. So they own gym. No surprise there. Yeah, of course. Had gotten contracts for construction for a job with the SQ. So they've done construction for a building for Quebec's FBI. You can't make this up. And to restore the As National Assembly. So a, po a political building, an office. <laughs> Influential biker was moving money, millions of dollars of blow when he got arrested in 2006. And then he was sent to the prison in Bordeaux where he found himself being the neighbor of and protector of Niccolo Rizzuto, the father, grandfather, or the great, uh, sorry, the godfather of the Montreal Mafia. Remember in 2006, they were all hit, I think 2004, 2006, they were hit with Operation Colisée. We always talk about that with Del Balzo and all that. And that's when their enemies started to strike. So during that time, 70-year-old or 69-year-old Niccolo Rizzuto, I don't know how old he was, probably 60s, was stuck in prison and he needed protection and he made his money do the docking and he was protected by the bikers. No surprise. Like many Hells Angels, Brouillette had pled guilty and said, no, not pled guilty, he had pled to the judge that he had left the bikers in good terms a little bit before leaving the penitentiary in 2015. So they said 2016 earlier. Now they're saying it's 2015. So I guess he pled this in court in 2015 and then he was released in 2016. That's what it means. But the parole board of Canada said they were skeptical, rightfully so. Here he is. He says, Hells Angels member of the Trois-Rivières chapter. Now, we read an article earlier that Max sent us. The Hells Angels Trois-Rivières had an underling club. Who was that underling club? And you're, do you remember? The Rowdy Crew, perhaps? Let's read. Né au printemps. Remember, guys, I do not read this yet. I did not read this yet. I just saw that they mentioned Rowdy Crew in this article. I'm jumping to luck at that. So I, just, I cheated. Now I see it. We're going to read it in a sec. Born in spring of 1972. He is the son of Aurel Brouillette, a future Hells Angels of the, of the Trois-Rivières chapter, one of the founders of the gang. And he opened, I think he opened a disco or a club or something in the Dominican Republic in 2009. No shock, I showed you pictures of them clubbing, uh, clubbing over there or partying. In 1990, at 18 years old, he became, became one of the youngest founders or one of the youngest members or found, and, and the founder of the Rowdy Crew, de La Valtrie, a defunct club of the Hells Angels. So now we have an answer, guys. Where are the Rowdy Crew? They are defunct. Probably because of police investigations, takedowns, and the biker war. There's, it's got to be the reason. It's the most logical. But here you have it. At 18 years old, he, he, he paid his dues. Huh? He joined the COQ system. And he probably offed people. You can almost guarantee it. That's what they're created for, guys. Pedal and off people and create a buffer for the Hells Angels. On the 5th of December, 1995, at 23 years old, he became the youngest member of the Hells Angels in Quebec. In 1995, okay, I thought he was patched in the 2000s, so this is a little game changer. Yeah, it's not in the unusual for a 23-year-old to join the Hells Angels still in the 1995 eras, right? It's not, because remember, they were losing members, they're in the middle of the biker war, they're trying to, they were recruiting left and right, they were patching over other clubs, you know, they were trying to fill their ranks, so I'm not surprised by that, okay. It would have been it would have been much more significant if he would have been say patched in in 2006 2010 you know then I would have been wow that's what I thought a few moments ago so he became a Hell's Angels in 1995 in October of 1997 he was condemned to six years of incarceration for having helped the hitman Serge Kesnel escape the police officers when they had assassinated a trafficker for rock machine. Claude Rivard, Le Pic, we saw, we mentioned him briefly earlier in the Montreal neighborhood of Pointe aux Trembles. Pointe aux Trembles, remember, east, 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 that's the absolute tip of Montreal Island. The absolute tip. Let me tell you, the police officers, they don't live in Verdun. They don't live in uh, Little Burgundy. They don't live in Centreville. Where do you think they live? They don't want to live too far from the city. I'm giving you a hint. A lot of them, their neighbors are cops living there. Now, I gotta ask you, could that make them corruptible? Because the bikers also love that area. They've been there since history. It's been history that they've been there 
for decades. You wonder how many officers got corrupted. We already have plenty of evidence of officers easily getting corrupted and falling for it. That's the best way I can say falling. We had a chief of police of one of these investigations, Kakajou. One of them, he literally finished his retirement and he wanted, he said, I'm tired of my pension of a, you know what? Those who remember the butthole, pension of a butthole. And he went and he, he asked René Charlebois to give him some cash. And boy, did René Charlebois repay him in full. After René escaped from prison, he, he recorded a tape. He could not get over the fact that this police officer who was against him this whole time had used them for his own benefit. He just couldn't take it. He didn't want to keep... René Charlebois offed himself. He knew he couldn't off himself without letting the world. Let that be a message to any of you cops. You're a fool if you play this game. Let's keep going. Don't even be a cop if you want to do something like that. In May of 2006, he's considered like one of the most influential Hells Angels in the province by 2006, okay? And in an anti-drug operation called Fusion... And at the same time as another godfather named Eve, Ivan Czech. Ex oh, is this a okay, le cahier? No, it's Ivan Czech. It says there's an ex-police officer of Saint Foy, Richard Saint Chagrin. Saint -Chagrin. That, that means Richard without tears in English. And the criminologist Roger Belmar. What happened? This network of Hells Angels were among the principal clients that had imported to Quebec 700 kgs of cane coming from Colombia. Inside of... A Aluminum ingots and expedited by boat. Brouillette had bought for nearly $5 million. He was found guilty of this plot and gangsterism, and he was condemned to 67 years in prison. A month, sorry. 67 months. So that's like equivalent of what? Five years? Probably five or six years of penitentiary in January 2008. 67 months, guys. And he left in what? 2016. So he did the full sentence? Interesting. That will be a new new one. Someone doing his full sentence. I gotta admit, he did it, right? I can't say my magical word this time. It seems like. In April 2013, he got three additional years of incarceration after he had pled guilty for his involvement. in, uh, And it was in Operation Shark QC in 2013. He got three additional years. Now, February 2015, 2015 of February. Before having been transferred to the transitional home, like Gregory Woolley, like Renal Desjardins, they all been transferred to transitional homes before being allowed to leave. So him too, after his sentence, he's, he, he was deposited inside of a transition home. He declares to the parole board of Canada that he took his retirement from the Hells Angel. Enrico has not proceeded to any arrests yesterday, it says. But it did seize $180,000 cash, firearms, silencers, three bulletproof vests, and hundreds of grams of cane, the H green plant, and the plant itself, as well as computers that was served, whatever, his personal computer. They make it sound like the computer was, a, was part of the operation, like it was helping that much. Let's not make a big deal out of it. Everyone has a computer. His boots could also be could be considered a weapon, you know, to be used for his operation. His clothes, too. They're making a big deal out of that. Do we have anything else? Yeah, yeah that's, the one, that's the one. It's the same one. Wow, huh? What a big roadmap. So we went from the middle of the biker war, Renaud Jean, then we got to the Rowdy Crew. And from the Rowdy Crew, we got to one of its founders. Did he truly retire? Nah, as you can see, only God knows the answer to that question. Thank you so much for watching. Help me out. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, of course. And don't stay on the side. Subscribe to get the latest on the Canadian mob wars.